Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. Um, today, my guest is Dr. Robert Bowker, and he is actually going to run his slideshow from his computer today, and we've got his screen share working. So we're not going to unshare the screen just to do the intros. But thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's so lovely to have Bob back. This is his fourth webinar with us, and we're really excited to, I think this is a continuing story from the previous webinars, right, Bob? I think so. Uh, yeah. Great. It, it all fits in together. It's all, it's all one talk. It's Great. So Bob, just give everybody a brief, you know, uh, bio. So for people who don't know who you are, there may be some still out there. Um, just give us a brief bio and then we'll jump right in. Okay. Uh, I grew up in Northern Maine. Uh, I'm done graduate. Then I went to vet school, practiced for a while. And I went back and got a PhD, did a postdoc. We've moved all around. I was in Galveston for five years. Then I went to New York city, which is too many people. Then I went to Idaho, which was nobody who was out there. So we finally came to mission and I've been at the vet school for 30 years and I retired five years ago, six years ago, five years ago or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, Where in Maine, Bob? Uh, do you know where Bangor is? Yeah. Oh, north of that. Okay. South of Millinocket. Oh yeah, which way to Millinocket? Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all evergreen trees wilderness so it's, it's, it's beautiful i uh i i went to the university of new hampshire and spent a, a lot of hours up in maine so it's really okay beautiful. yeah it's quite rural yep so it was just a, uh anyway yeah so that's kind of and i've been here we've been hunkered down for oh the past year which i i like being hunkered down and i don't have an excuse to have to go someplace so it's just a, shouldn't say that but that's okay. I, I'm feeling the same way. I'm really actually liking being home. This is the longest I have been home since I can remember. Um, and maybe I'm busy. I'm, I'm busy. I had lots to do and that sort of stuff. So yeah, uh, I'm still. I've been trying to write a paper for the last number of months, and it's uh, it's getting there because it's, it's complicated. So all right. Well, hopefully you can make this topic simple for us today. So so okay. what are we going to talk about today? Uh, basically, uh, obviously the horse's foot, but uh, there's always been a discussion, if you, depending on who you are, whatever our argument, uh, with what is the major loading structure, and uh, whether it's the hoof wall or the more solar portions of the foot, because to me, the hoof wall is more of a, I always say a decoration, which I realize is an extreme term but it gets it up on the table and mean that it's not the major loading structure because if you just load the hoof wall those uh, the hoof wall anatomically is not really designed to be the major structure because there's a lot of ongoing changes you see on the inside of the foot and many of them lead to pathology as opposed to uh, the bottom part of the foot and uh, so it's just kind of a uh, in between the hoof wall uh, being 100% and the sole being 100%, it's somewhere in between, but it's closer to uh, the hoof wall being a smaller portion of that, which many people get upset with that, but I want to help the foot. So that's the way I do it. Okay. Okay. Yep. And then you just forward your slideshow. There should okay. be on your screen, it'll show up a little arrow this way, left hand side. Way. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, like I just mentioned, there's, a, there's always been a controversy uh, whether what's what part of the what part of the foot is the loading structure, and it's, is it the exclusively the epidermal hoof wall is the primary one, and that happens when you have this I always say this peripheral loading device on or hoof, you know, or, or shoe, and uh, versus if you have if you don't have a shoe the it's a more of a solar surface, and but it depends on what the horse is walking on, whether it's a, a conformable surface or a firm surface. It's a firm surface, and the hoof wall is beyond the sole, then it's the hoof wall becomes the loading structure again. So it's it's a, so I'm towards somewhere between uh, the solar surface or being 70, 80, 90 percent. I don't really know the number, but it's somewhere up there being the majors, uh, being that 
portion of the horse's weight. And, uh, and that's kind of what I'll try to show you. There's a lot of things going on in the foot. And depending on how you load it, the foot will change and adapt and respond. And I'll show you where you have the, this peripheral loaded portion of the foot being the loading structure. Uh, if it's 100% with a shoe on, uh, you start to see de deterioration of the internal parts of the foot, the hoof wall. I mean, the, the bone, the coffin bone will start to deteriorate as well as the, the back part of the foot. So that's kind of where I'm going with this. And it's kind of been the same song and dance I've been talking about for really a long time because I never grew up with horses. I never saw a horse until I went to vet school. And uh, uh, so it's just, a, I think I had a, a more open-minded view when I started studying the foot and what was what the structures were doing and that sort of stuff. So when you put a shoe on, what it is, the most all of the weight is on the, the hoof wall of the epidermis. And from a comparative anatomy point of view, there are very few creatures that walk exclusively on their epidermal hoof wall or their fingernail. And if you can think of them, one mammal or marsupial that does that, I'm open to rethink what I've been thinking the last 30 years. So um, so what you have here, when you ha have this peripheral loading portions of the foot, this here is what you see on the right-hand side, things begin to happen. The frog begins to atrophy, meaning that it gets smaller. The central sulcus, which is right here, it starts, I always say it starts to migrate caudally, it starts to go towards the fetlock. And that means the back part of the foot is not working right. And the toe, starts to elongate, and there's a lot of stuff happening on the inside. Um, what I mean by this is that when you put the shoe on, uh, a lot of what the foot is doing, it's responding to the environment, and the trimmer, farrier, veterinarian is a major por portion of this, and so when you put the shoe on, the certain things you inherently do is, when you put a shoe on, obviously the hoof wall is a loading structure, but it's either expense, time consuming, whatever you lengthen the time between changing the shoes. Usually it's beyond, you know, six, seven, eight, nine weeks. And that's when you start to get into problems with all of this sort of stuff, atrophying the frog uh, and the frog atrophying and the toe elongating and this sort of, thing. because this, these things here, when you have this frog atrophying, atrophy, atrophy, atrophy at, gets smaller. Um, and the south, central sulcus starts to migrate caudally and the toe elongate. This is when you get to pathology. All of my navicular horses, they always had a, a longer toe. The frog is atrophied and you'll see changes pathology in the frog six, seven, eight years before you'll see it at the navicular bone. Okay, so it's just a, so that's what happens is how you trim the foot. And if you, uh, uh, when you look at it, when you, trim it long time intervals, lots of things happen. This is a, a radiograph with a, sh uh, with a shod foot. You have this uh, uh, radiopaque marker down the wall. What you see with this foot here, this has an extremely long toe. And I believe much of that is due to the length of time in between shoeings, okay? I've met one farrier around the world who read much, much of my stuff and, and has shoes on the horse and they, they, he puts shoes on frequently every four or five weeks. So he's maintained a short toe. So when you start to see this, you have this very long toe and then it's like the horse has uh, been uh, wearing skis. What you're gonna see though, is that there's gonna be bone changes with inside the coffin bone. What's happening is the, the load uh, is different when you have a long, long toe versus a short toe. And it's actually the loss of, of uh, calcium in the bone itself. So it gets more and mess, more and more osteoporotic. And this is what you see down here, though. When you see this long toe, and I always have told students that is the next horse you see, you can bet all your mortgage, double or nothing, that it'll have a long toe. And most, most all the time, I've never met a short-toed horse. It's very rarely that you'll see that. And when you start to see this, the point being is that this foot starts to adapt to that internally, starts to adapt and respond. So when you start the long toe, the thinning of the cortex gets 
it gets thinner and thinner and thinner and it gets very porous. And note that the, uh, the back part of the foot here, this is the beginning of Palmar process here and this back part of the foot atrophies. And this is the problem with most of the horses. Most of these horses, in my opinion, much of the diseases we see in the foot is man-made, it's us, how we trim, okay? And what you see here, just a little uh, high power, what it is is you have this hoof wall here, this is the shoe, this is the radio pick marker. All along here, this dorsal cortex gets thinner and thinner and thinner and what I, and it gets porous. And if you, especially if you had uh, digital radiographs, if you blow it up, this here gets fuzzy. When it's, you see it gets fuzzy, it means it's, it's very porous. And many of you are women probably watching this. And if you went to your doctor and the doctor came out and showed you a radiograph of uh, your legs or whatever, and he, he said, we got some good news for you. Your legs, you'd be able to jump higher and run faster and that sort of stuff because they're so light, they're full of holes. You'd be very upset. And, it's, and But yet we expect this thousand pound horse to run on these uh, bones here that are very porous and it's, it's, Mother Nature doesn't like that. Okay, so here, I mentioned the shoe, it's, it's mostly the hoof wall. The opposite end of the spectrum is that uh, you'll have uh, the sole surface is a primary loading structure. Here, what you see is a feral horse from Southwest. And what you see here, this is a central sulcus. This is a frog. This is the sole. You see this hoof wall. Is, the hoof wall is from here, here where the arrow is to the outside here. But what you see, it's been worn down. There's only a thin rim of it all the way around. And this is out west, they're actually running along what I call a granola surface. It's like, uh, uh, well, it's like granola, uh, cereal. It's, it's more, more pebbly rock and it's like sandpaper. So it's actually wearing down the solar portions of the foot. This here is, this is a feral horse on the left-hand side. It's a domestic horse that's in a, it's in the Southwest United States in Arizona. It's, this is kind of, I got pictures of these where these were actually going uphill or downhill and they, they weren't trimmed. And what you see here, central sulcus is here. This is the bars, the hoof wall is here. And what you see here, there's a somewhat of a dirt plug. I'll show you the environment of here. The bars are, are, are prominent. And what has happened, what you actually see here, you see the hoof wall, what is being worn, it goes way up here, okay? It's not just this thin room here. And what will happen, this will eventually break up. The toe is kind of long from my perspective, but the, these horses were going uphill or downhill all the time. They, they were not on level ground at all. So when you see these feral horses, this is uh, what, we, what I did with Gene Ovenick and Barbara Page back in the 1990s. This is a radiograph of a feral horse, a real life feral horse uh, that we'd I tranquilized, took radiographs of it, and you can see without these radiopaque markers, you, oops, you really won't see where the hoof wall is. This is a wire along the hoof wall. And so the x-rays actually go through much of the hoof wall. You don't really see the, how thick the wall is here. The toe here is fairly long, but it, it has to be worn up. But what you see, this, this uh, lighter, wider area, that is the dirt plug. And you see what the, the purpose of the dirt plug, it does have a, have a function. See, it brings this break over back from here. You see at the very extreme toe down to here. So that in the feral horse world, these horses usually will have uh, a shorter break over. And what happens is uh, the bones will be very dense. It'll be the same thickness all the way down to the, the, to the bottom. And most all of them do not have a Palmar process, okay? The Palmar process is kind of a response of the bone to a longer hoof wall toe. It's kind of like if you were out in a boat canoeing and you wanted to have more balance, you'd put an outrigger on the side. That's what this Palmer process is here. So it's a, uh, but that's what you see all the time. With the understanding is uh, this here is in the Southwest United States. Uh, and also a lot of what they're walking on is actually granola. So there's not much of a dirt plug in these as opposed to what I showed you before. This here is the, uh, oh, this foot here was from one of these horses here. This is in Southwest United States, this is Arizona, okay? And if you know in Arizona, there's just no water. 
So if you look at this foot here, it doesn't look too bad. It's being worn a little bit. Uh, it is a little bit uh, underrun, but what it has is a straight coronet, okay? And that's kind of what, I, what I'd like. I'll show you why and all that sort of stuff. So it's, this is what you see the, the terrain, but very little of this terrain is, is level. So, uh, uh, and again, the main thing is these, the feet are a product of the environment because if you go to certain parts of the world where these horses don't have a surface, uh, ground surface where the, the soil can actually wear the hoof wall down, the hoof wall just keeps growing, okay? And again, if you look at this uh, foot again, you see there's a small amount of weight going to be on, a, on, the, on the actual wall because the wall goes from this arrow here, it's quite thick. So they only see a small part of here that's being worn down. And depending on the surface, you may or may not have a, a dirt plug. I always like to say there's like five, 20, 25% of the weight will be on the hoof wall. It's not hundred percent, okay? But if you had this horse on an asphalt walkway or something in the first lap, most all the weight would be on the hoof wall. So it just varies with what the horses uh, are standing. So if a feral horse, foot that's born and raised there, you have to remember that it's being worn and sculpted by the environment from day one, as opposed to uh, oops, this horse here where uh, he was a domestic horse and he was lived, wasn't in this part of Arizona, wasn't dry. And he, so he was an adult before he got into the, this arid uh, dry barren surface. So it takes a while for this foot to get uh, uh, to looking like this. So it takes a while. Okay. And again, what you see here, this blue here is the sole. I mean, the hoof wall. The yellow here is the sole. This white here is the white line. Is this area here corresponds to this little thin rim. So most of this hoof wall has been removed. If, if you could extend this here, this would be breakover. It would be here if you were on a, a domestic horse. And in, in Virginia or wherever, because many trimmers and farers, they, uh, they may get a bevel here, but they don't uh, come inside the white line. And that's kind of what I've, the last five or six years I've started to emphasize that when you trim, you have to come inside the white line, okay, to bevel it. I'll show you the reason for it. What's the that. reason for not coming into the white line? Excuse me? What's the reason for not coming into the white? Everyone's line? scared of the nerves and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's just gospel. I mean, I've talked to so many fairies and they say you can't come inside the white line and because they're afraid they're going to uh, uh, treat the horse with a, with a rasp or the nail. And of course, then the owner gets upset with the fairy. But what it is, is uh, I'll show you here is, uh, uh, well, I'll just start it here. This is a hoof wall. So you, everyone knows it's growing down from the coronet down this way, correct? Yep. To the ground. This is the sole. Very few people realize that the, which I gave on my previous slide, that the, uh, the bars have lamina. The purpose of lamina, this, this is the bars here. And through this region here, there are uh, lamina of the bars. They also, the purpose of bars is to produce hoof walls. So this hoof is also, is growing from the coronet down to the ground, everyone knows. But down here, it's also growing from the bars and it's growing towards the toe. It's like a conveyor belt, okay? So what you have here is, this is growing down, and, but also at a variable but slower rate, the, the sole is growing towards the toe. So if you only trim to the white line, this toe gets longer and longer and longer, okay? So that's why, and if you just trim to the, the white line, the, the toe would get longer and longer and longer. But you have to, in one of my previous ones, I mentioned to you that when you start to bevel through this right rear, white line here, you have to take your, your rasp and start from the solar side and just slowly go up this way. Yeah. Whoops, sorry. Uh, it's okay. It's you, you go this, and you, I prefer not to rasp down this way from the top to the bottom. You have to remove so much of the hoof wall to get to this point as opposed to just a little bit here. And you can, if, if the hoof wall was way out here, 
that's where the arrow is. And if you bevel this way, oops, sorry. No, no it's working. Uh, if you oops. bevel it this way, you could just remove a little bit of hoof wall and bring the break over back from here all the way back to here without hardly doing any, removing any hoof wall. And are there any nerves or anything in that hoof no. wall at the toe that we have to worry about? No, no. Okay. No, no. With a qualifier, if you just do it, say the first two, three millimeters here or something like that, there's nothing. But if you go up a centimeter and that sort of stuff, you do get into the into the corium way up here, but there's, there's virtually nothing. So as long as you come from the bottom, bottom just yeah. angle your rack. You, if, if you're, if you're, I always tell owners, if the owners are afraid they're going to uh, do something disastrous and make the horse cripple for the rest of his life, just take a rasp and rasp around this area here between 10 and two o'clock, mm -hmm. two or three times with a rasp, then come back in a couple of days and do it again. And you'll see that you're, you're not going to do anything to the horse, but what, is, what you're doing is you're actually making things better because you're bringing more of the uh, weight towards this back part of the foot. You want most of the weight way back here as opposed to the hoof wall. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I think it's appropriate for this question right now. Somebody says, would very steep hooves where the walls have gotten too long, but in height, all, all, be also considered a too long toe? So in other words, a horse with high heels, I'm not sure that question makes sense to me. Um, would very steep hooves where the walls have gotten too long, but in height, be also considered a too long toe? In other words, a horse with high heels. Well, the horse with high heels, often they have, um, I don't deal with too many of those, but the when they're too high and the frog is not on the ground, you are going to have problems with that horse. So you've got to keep the heels um, managed so that the frog remains on the ground. The, gr the frog should kiss the ground. Okay. You don't want the frog to be loaded. It's been squished. Like many of these therapy boots that certain companies have. I'm sorry. I, I talk with my hands. That's <laughs> the arrow's going all over. <laughs> is, is that when you have these ther therapy boots, they all have, or rehab boots, they have a... a a frog insert. Right. And when you put the boot on and they put it up against this frog, depending on the height of it, it'll put pressure on the frog. So it doesn't, the frog stops working. It actually, there's, if I just said there's an enormous amount of blood flowing through this frog, that's a very conservative estimate. There's more than what you even think of going through the frog. And so by putting, it's kind of like when you take your finger and you, you press your, your thumb against your finger, you, you close all of, you put the pressures too high, you close all the blood, blood vessels so there's no blood going through that part of the foot. That's what happens with, when you have uh, uh, put pressure on this frog. So with high heels, if this frog is not uh, uh, touching the ground, kissing the ground, it's gonna be problematic because quite often this central sulcus starts to go back up the foot. So too much pressure and not enough pressure due to high heels are both bad. They're both bad, yeah. yeah. Okay. I always say that the frog likes to kiss the ground, just, just touch it. Okay. Are we going the right direction? I don't know. Yep. Uh, all right, so this is one of these uh, where that uh, paint horse was. Obviously not the horse, but paint. But you see, this is a, it's not a bad looking foot. This is a little bit underrun, okay? But you see this coronet is straight. Yeah. When the coronet is straight, I'm not into angles, but when it's straight, it, usually the central sulcus is on the ground. And that central sulcus is kind of like if you take your hands and put your index finger and thumb together where you're the webbing between your thumbs together, that's, that will be the central sulcus. You want that flat on the ground kissing the round, okay? And what you see, uh, I'm going the wrong direction, sorry. What you see, this, this is the central sulcus. This here is the, uh, the caudal part of it. That is, you'd like to see that. When this is up between the heel bulbs, the frog is not really working that much. 
And that's kind of what you see uh, uh, when you have uh, this straight coronet. When you see that quite often, most of all the times I've seen it, the central sulcus is flat on the ground. That's what you want. It means the frog is working well. To me, the frog is the most important part of the foot. And if you notice most feet, uh, because the toes are too long, the frog is atrophy. It doesn't do much, okay? Okay. I don't know if we answered that question. Uh, um, I think you did, because if, you're, if you have a really long heel and it's taking the frog away from the ground, you're it's, gonna it's, need- Yeah, it's just, it's lifting it off the ground, yeah. And then, then what happens, the frog, uh, the heels start to come together. So you start getting contracted heels because you don't have the frog touching the ground. And like what you see here, but all right, with this, this is a feral horse. You, you fall, you see way up here, this foot, this is where the horse is walking on. All right. It's worn there. This is a, then this horse with the granola. And that's what you want. You actually want the hoof wall to actually almost engulf the frog. Because what this central sulcus is, is the, the valley here, but the, on the underside, you have the frog stay. Right. I mentioned this to you before. This frog stay is like a, a mast, M-A-S-T, of a, one of these uh, sailing ships. Yep. And what it is, is there are uh, fascial sheets that attach to that. And that takes a lot of the workload off the internal structures of the foot. When this central sulcus starts to go towards the fetlock, the, the fascial sheets that attach to that frog stay are not tight and not tight. They're loose. They're, they're not going to take a lot of the load off the foot. That's the purpose of this, this central sulcus here. Okay. Okay. So far, so good. Are we. Yep. So, uh, uh, so, okay. Oops. All right. This here is uh, another horse, another environment. And see, this is a, a feral horse, which you see, this is a little bit underrun. Yep. And the toe is a little bit long. Part of that is because it's going uphill and down. But the main thing you want to watch, though, see the this coronet is straight, which means the back part of the foot is working well. Okay. That's, is his other front foot? I said I assume that's a front so foot. This, this 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 is a domestic horse that was released out. This is a more upright, and it's uh, it's going to be a higher heel. And this is the frog is barely going to. Um, this is at a rehab place and okay. they were releasing them out. But this this is the problem part of that foot on this, this horse here. You weren't supposed to see that, but it's- Okay, just, all right. You know. Well, because we, I'm getting a lot of questions about feet that are high-low. So I was gonna hold that off and ask you at the end, but that was looking like a high-low they, horse. They, yeah, the, the high-low, the uh, you have to be careful how you trim them because you, uh, I firmly believe this, that you can gradually change the, uh, the low one is going to be usually the sore one. But if you uh, bevel that, uh, if you, uh, here, if you bevel that, bring that back, you can uh, get the, the frog working more. And that's what you're going to try to do with the, uh, I finally figured it out. Where, where where were we just a minute ago? Uh, there. Oh. Oh. The, all right, this here is that by beveling this, you'll get this foot back more, the frog working more. And you can gradually do that, but you have to go slower with this this upright foot. That that upright foot is going to have problems in itself. Okay. And we're talking a long time because the bone is, when you see this, the bone is shaped change to that, that shape to conform, conform to the, the, the hoof wall itself. Okay, it's, it's taken years to, to get that way, so it'll take a long time to get it back, and a lot of people just give up because it takes so long. Uh, okay. This here is, what I'm showing you is this back part of the foot is the uh, most important part of the foot from my perspective. This is uh, another one of these horses. You can see the frog is atrophied, but you see this frog stay, uh, well, the central side of the frog stay is and you can see this horse is actually running on this part of the foot. And 
these these horses aren't trimmed at all but you can see that's that's what is worn down and this horse is going uphill or downhill that's why it's got a long toe but the horse's hat he's not sore or anything like that because this is the active part of the foot you can see this this here the, the hoof wall starts here and and it, but it's actually being that's why it is actually supporting the weight here okay this is so the, it almost looks like the heel bulbs, the bars, and the hoof wall, and the frog are all at the back of the foot taking the load. Yeah, yeah. And see, and the, the, the key thing is that you see this central sulcus, it's on the ground. And the inside of the central sulcus where you got the frog say, that's the mast of a ship. Right. And uh, one of the other talks, I can't remember what I have here, is that uh, there are fascial sheets that are inside the foot that attach to that uh, 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 frog stay. And that's taking all the load. The, the supporting the bony column coming down and, and allowing the blood flow to go through this foot and that, that sort of stuff. But when it's up here, when this central sulcus is up here and where the, the biggest part of it is, is problematic if it's way up here because it's not functioning because the, the frog stay, when it's like this, it's perpendicular to the ground. Mm -hmm. And when it starts to migrate up towards the fetlock, the tip of it starts to point towards the cotton, the navicular bone. Okay, so I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the word tensegrity, but I've had a couple other webinars where they've talked about tensegrity, and it seems to me that the, the combination of the bones and the frog stay and the back part of the foot have to have a certain amount of tensegrity for it all to work properly. And when you get that long toe, you lose that system. Oh yeah, no, I agree. I, that's kind of what I'm doing. But within 10 seconds, see when you have the long toe and you're on a level ground, this central sulcus is actually, is migrating towards the fetlock. Right. And what it's doing is, I'll show you this, there's other things that's happening. When you do that, these ligaments inside the foot or these fascial sheets inside the foot, they disintegrate. Right, so you lose whatever tensegrity you need to hold everything in an order. <clears throat> yes, yeah, yeah. I think I have a, a slide to show you, uh, just to show you where some of these fascial sheets are. Okay. Okay, so this foot here, what you see is, this is one of these, uh, this is from Arizona. The hoof wall is here, and then the hoof wall, but it's actually worn way back this way, and this here is the hoof. You see this right here? That's being worn, but you see the caudal part of the central sulcus is really on the ground. It's narrow, it's not uh, shallow here, but it's, it's uh, the, the frog stay is perpendicular. And when you see that, that the width of this frog is, is uh, it's, it's quite wide compared to, uh, it's not a naturally frog, I guess maybe that's what I'm trying to say, okay? When this central sulcus is going this way, the width of that frog gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and narrower and narrower and narrower. This is not an atrophy frog. So, so one way to look at that frog is it should be a nice, wide, plump frog. You want, yeah, the wider that it is, the better. And the length, uh, oh, I can't remember. Can I move us a little bit? Oh, yeah. yes. So is that this, you want the width of the frog to be major. It should be 80 to 90% of the, the length of the, uh, of, the, of the frog, okay? The length is not the important thing. A horse with severe laminitis, the end of the apex of the frog is at the toe. It's because this sole is migrating this way. Yeah. And when you start to bevel this hoof wall here, you can wear that down, but you bring everything caudally and the frog gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I think my last webinar, this webinar yeah. was like that, okay. Yeah. And what you see in this foot here, see this is the hoof wall here, but the actual hoof wall is worn. Most of the weight is gonna be on the sole part of here, all right, and this, this foot. It's not on the hoof wall. The hoof wall is a decoration and if you, uh, Keep that in mind and realize that it's not absolute decoration, but it's pretty close. 
that the loading structures have to be on the solar part of the foot, back here as well as here. This here, the important part of this part of the foot, the frog in there, that's where all the, the neural machinery is. And this frog is where most of the blood flow is. I know there's some foot gurus who say there's no blood in the frog, but that's not quite right. That's kind of the spiel for the last 20 years. Okay. All right. And again, <clears throat> why I'm a been a firm believer in the in the dirt plug is this this is the dirt plug here. It it really shortens the toe. It brings the brake over back so it puts less stress on all this equipment here. But the other thing here, it, it enables this this tissue to heal. So and I have a question about uh, the dirt plug. The dirt plug. Someone. And they um, they said in a previous webinar you talked about the importance of the dirt plug for stimulating the the hoof development and that horses only have them removed once a month when the trimmer comes, right? Um, the question is about thrush and management. Um, how do you manage thrush? So she says, I find my damp conditions mean that I have to spray the horse's feet with something every three to four days, otherwise thrush starts to develop. How do you manage to go a month without attending to this and perhaps your soil conditions are very different? I've already heard that. If, if you, it depends on the, if you keep a shorter toe, Okay, uh, like, like, like this foot here, this is the frog is here. Oops, this we're is not the, the, the apex of the frog is ballpark somewhere in here, okay? Yep. This here is a very long toe. You see this is a sole here. You see this little divot here? Yep. That's the crena. Yep. Crena is that it's kind of, Embryo, embryologically is where the two halves of the foot come together, right there. When you see that, the toe is too long. And I would, I believe, I, <clears throat> I don't go uh, in wet climates other than to visit, uh, but the, where's, where's my, that if you start to bevel the toe to get rid of this uh, crena, and you can do it by Doing the right is again this hoof wall comes down here. The crana would be uh yeah, right, it's right in here. Okay. Okay, let me let me yeah. See this is the sole here. Yeah. The crana is here. The white line is outside of that. Oops. Then you got your hoof. Okay. Uh, Go back to this here. So this is the sole here, the yellow. Yep. This is the white line. The crenner is going to be right here. If you have a, a hoof where you actually just trim it off way out here, uh, where this is all epidermis and you got your white line and your crenna, this is all extra foot that the horse has to uh, biomechanically uh, move when it's when it's moving. So. What you're trying to do is, uh, we're getting back to the the, the thrush and everything, because like, usually in those thrushy frogs, the the toe is too long, and the this central sulcus is on the way to the fetlock. It's narrow. Mm -hmm. Like like I said, if uh, you can't see me, can you? Um, if you turn to your, I think left, and raise your hands, we can see you because we're actually yeah. There oh, you go. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> if you take your index fingers together and your thumb together where your webbing comes, that's a central sulcus. Okay. When it's down like this, it, uh, uh, it's very narrow and the oh. central and the frog stay is, is perpendicular. When it's uh, the frog is, uh, when you move this toe back, this central sulcus uh, uh, gets uh, just a minute. Forget where I was. Yeah, this central sulcus gets uh, more shallow, and the frog at the at the heels will expand. And so, in the when it's very, I'm getting trying to answer this question when it's very wet. That when this uh, so, uh, I want to go back to the 
this here, if if you start to bevel, bevel the sole off here, okay, I mean the hoof wall off here, yeah. and when you go through the white line, start to bevel it here, and over several trims, uh, what I would do is trim frequently. I, I say if you trim on Monday, come back on Friday and just do a few more rasps, you'll actually get through that um, and do it from the solar side. Um, and this is by beveling this way from the ground up. You'll be able to bring the hoof from here into here, okay? Here, by you, you're just gonna shorten it a little bit and you're going through most of the white line here. You'll, the white line will be there, but this crana will be gone. And when you do that, you'll notice that the frog will increase in width. The central sulcus will come forward and it becomes more shallow. And I would uh, wager that you'll re at least reduce the amount of thrush that's there. So, so are you saying that thrush to a large degree results from the deep central sulcus that's migrating back and therefore making an environment for bacteria? It's an opportunistic bug. Okay. I'm not the first one to say that, but microbiologists have said that. Because what it is, uh, everyone's aware there are, are, uh, there are scent glands that open up onto the central sulcus. And that's like in us where under our armpits and groin and everything like that, it's a lot of protein and all this sort of good stuff. So it's, it actually secretes onto this. And so that's a good medium for the bacteria. That's why it's there. So the bigger plumper frog with the... Uh, you want a shallow central sulcus. Right, that's what I'm trying to get to. Yeah, the, the, central, the, the central sulcus being shallow is what you want. Because then it's it's kind of like like you're webbing in your fingers, okay? It's just very it's nothing there as opposed to when it's deep. So it, is there an advantage as you're as you're adjusting that toe length to and working to getting a plumper frog? Is there any advantage to packing the foot with a material that's going to be antimicrobial as a dirt plug, like artificially making a nice healthy dirt plug to keep everything clean while you're going through this process? Yep. I've never done it, but probably, I'm sure. Uh, what, what keeps it in there though? Is it stay in there? Well, I, I'm ex actually experimenting with one of my horses right now. I have three horses that I trim and she's had laminitis. And so her feet are improving, they're getting better. But I basically, I packed Artemud in her foot and I used one of uh, our prototype materials. We're working on some, some different kinds of pads. And then I just cast it to keep everything together. And I've left it on. I'm gonna take it off in a couple more days and see what it looks like. Just to kind of give the foot a chance to be in a, in a healthy, clean, antimicrobial environment. So I'm curious, I'm just, that's kind of my- I, never done, I wouldn't be surprised if it would help, um, but, um, but I, every place I've been, Australia, Norway, Sweden, and many places here, it's uh, uh, when you keep the toe short, the frog gets better, things get better. And then is there also, uh, uh, you know, like, um, nutritionally, the horse needs what it needs to be healthy so that, you know, if we, if the horse is compromised in some other way, is that going to show up in that frog? I'm sure, I mean, the extremes probably. Okay. 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 That's where we were. Okay. And again, this is from, um, I forget his, the book, uh, I forget name. Anyway, he's a well-known trimmer from out west. Jamie Jackson. Yes. Jackson. I knew the name. Yeah, and this is and here he's got a picture. Most of these horses, they feral horses, they have small feet. They usually don't have big feet. Okay. And so the point being, everyone says you need uh, you know, horses with small feet have problems. No, it's the way we're trimming. Okay, which I have a problem with. And this is an actual feral horse foot. Uh it's it's really a feral horse. He's, he's recovering from anesthesia. And what you see here, see, it's, this is a little bit underrun, and he shed his frog and that sort of stuff. But during, before we got there, he was actually, uh, there's a lot of dirt there. You know, and this, this here is another foot. And as you can see, 
they're a little bit underrun because they have to grow down before they're actually worn off. So, uh, and this indentation here, a lot of people, uh, which I'm, I don't believe in, they, they rasp the wall to get this natural arch here. And if you watch these horses, uh, if you just trim straight across, this will gradually form because that's where all the dirt blood comes out of the ground when the horse is running. Okay, those horses who are in uh, oh, oh, a reigning horse. I had a guy tell me once, this is a long time ago, that when he uh, he's in the, the arena, you can actually see the dirt spew out this way. And what it is, that is actually eroding that arch there. It's natural erosion in, in, in this foot. So the foot does a lot to keep itself healthy. Okay, and this is the same, same thing here. And again, the point being, the, it's very adaptable, but my spiel here is that you trim the hoof to get the internal parts of the foot to change. So in those uh, feet, uh, go back to here. This foot here, if you were to shorten this toe start doing an over a period of three, four week period, really come in, came inside so there's no longer a crena, the inside of the foot would change. You'd see as this central sulcus to come forward, the heels would get wider. And you can actually look at it by measuring the angles. This is coming down here, it gets broader. The inside of the foot is changing and it's getting stronger. Uh, and that's kind of what you, what you want. Because uh, I have this thing of, uh, Everyone wants a sound horse, but a sound horse, it just uh, take it literally, it means it's not sore or, or lame, but it doesn't mean the foot is healthy. Okay, and that's why uh, a lot of these horses, they'll be healthy one day and then the next day they're, the lame is all get out because they were, they were sound, but the inside of the foot was not healthy, as it could be, put it that way. All right. All right, this here is just to want to show you uh, that this foot, this is, this foot here is from uh, Northwest US uh, and it's a, a product of its environment. This here, this two or three feet here, I think I've shown many people before this. I got these from Brian Hampson from uh, Australia, that this is New Zealand. In New Zealand, these horses are actually running on a soft, uh, surface, a beach, like, and what you see, this hoof wall is overgrown and that sort of stuff. The central sulcus is going uh, towards the fetlock and everything, but there's nothing in the soil to wear the hoof down. That's why the hoof wall is growing longer. And this is just another one. These horses were sound though, okay. Uh, but, but if you took them out and put them on a hard surface, they'd be lame as all get out, okay. In this here, and, and if you saw those, that would be not so good. This here is the, the coronet is not straight. It's got a long toe, underrun, and all that sort of. But that's due to the environment. But the point being, the inside of the foot of this New Zealand feral horse, they're all uh, Brian. Then they've got these feet, and they did 60, 60 feet. The coffin bone was all in the same relationship. And this is the same thing here. It's a little bit elevated, but that's just because you got a dirt plug here. This is what you want in a healthy foot is this bone. And you see this, this bone here, even with all those bizarre hoof wall shape, the decoration as it were, the coffin bone here is pretty much like this. You can nitpick and all that sort of stuff, but it's basically the same. And it's relationship to the ground. Some people want to have it ground level. I like to have a little bit of elevation, but you got to remember this is the dirt plug, okay? But that's what you're trimming to get this inside of the foot to change. And it's not the bone, it's the connect, the fascial sheet for the, the tensegrity. So, so I think what you're trying to show us here is that um, different environments result in different outward appearing feet because it's either more abrasive or less abrasive. But when you look at these feral horses, first of all, the thing I notice is the bone density right? Um, and, and that their 
functionally their foot is healthy because it the they've adapted to that surface yes yeah and if it's not abrasive enough the hoof wall doesn't break off as much but it doesn't mean that the foot's unhealthy because it's still well aligned nice and dense got that angle palmer angle planner and um and so you know and these horses aren't under underweight they're not with a rider which of course has got to have some influence on the feet right yeah but you're a small woman so probably not <laughs> thank you bob okay. <laughs> okay all right so this here is again i want to emphasize this is the hoof wall this is the uh, the actual wear that's what's being supported so most of the weight on this horse is back here but this central sulcus it is narrow but the frog stay is uh vertical here because the end of the uh, central sulcus is here when the end of the central sulcus is way up here you know the central sulcus is is being tilted towards the navicular bone Okay. Yep. So, so we have a question. Um, uh, when you're when you're rasping ten to two, you're talking about from a clock ten to two, right? Ten to two. Yeah. And then, um, how someone's asking how much you would take off as you're rasping that ten to two. And I think this is a great picture to talk about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. This is uh, a horse we did. Uh, uh, we had a group of horses in. Uh, and what it is, they are all navicular horses. That's what I was interested in. And what you see here, this is, a, you see this is the crena. Okay. This is the hoof oil age. We've just taken the shoes off. You see this central sulcus is here. Yep. Uh, and the central sulcus is, was further back. This has been after, well, this is, yeah, I think we just took the shoes off. Uh, uh, the central sulcus is narrow, but it's, the end of it is, is going up the fetlock. Okay. And quite often, the, these are, are, are threshy. And uh, this here is the same foot a few months later, four or five months later. And what you see it, well, I don't know if I have a solar surface, but the solar surface is we beveled inside this white line. So we got rid of the crena. So this distance got shorter. And what it is, it brought the frog back on the ground. And this, you see this white here? that white is the sole. The hoof wall is not on the ground on these horses. Okay, it's so basically you bevel it enough to, to almost look like that x-ray with the dirt plug. Yeah, you bevel it around. I mean, this is when you're trying to, to, to treat these animals because a lot of these horses are, are steep and flared. Yep. They're usually flared on the lateral side and it's because of how they're, where the weight is. Is uh, if the, because uh, what I'm going to show you when they're steep and flared, the bone inside is changing. So to, to get rid of the steep and flared, you you have to, uh, I remember it was back in the 90s, I asked 10 different farriers, how do you get rid of the steep and flared part of the hoof wall? And I got 20 different answers. Okay. And then I just figured out, well, if you rasp the, around the hoof wall here, so there's not much of the uh, load on the, on the wall, so you're beveling. So you're beveling. Uh, if you just bevel at this point here, you'd, it wouldn't take you too long before you'd have some of the hoof wall on the ground. So you're, you want to rasp through this white line. So all the weight is going to be on this uh, sole here and part of the white line and the, whatever the frog is. Okay. And that's how you, and you'll gradually, and what will happen is the, uh, the foot will e equilibrate around the, the central part of the, the foot. The the load equilibrates. So these, these horses were all steep and flared. So eventually, just by doing it this way, most of these became more symmetrical. I won't say they're perfectly symmetrical, but they became more symmetrical. All right. And this, this you can see the sole here, you can see where we actually, oh, sorry, we actually removed a lot of the hoof wall here. So that's, that's where they're actually bearing their, most of the weight here. Okay, and this here is from the side, these, these feet where a short toe and this foot is getting there because this uh, 
caudal part of the coronet is, start, is still curved down, so the frog is not where I want it. Okay. So the is, the, is the straight over. coronet band a good indication of the frog being on the ground? I, I, I think I'm supposed to say yes. I think you, I didn't hear the beginning, but I, you, when it's straight, uh, like this, what you see here, this this comes this way and it comes down. That means the central sulcus is is up towards the fetlock. It's going towards the fetlock. It's open caudally. Okay, so that's so a curved coronet band is a indication of the where the frog is. Yeah, I, I think so, and what we've done. Yeah. Okay. And that's that's why on those uh, some of those feral horses, it's straight. Right. I'm not into angles because uh, because if you if you have, uh, if, the, if this is such a low heel, say, and if you bevel the toe this way from the sole, this heel will come up, okay? Uh, as well as, uh, the foot is going backward. It looks like the frog's coming forward, but the, the, the toe is coming backwards. Right. Okay. This is just another foot where you can actually see the wear, but you see, this is where the horse is walking on this uh, barren, dry area here, see how worn it is. That's where he's bearing weight. And it goes all the way back here. So most of the weight is gonna be on this back part of the foot and the solar surface. And this is not quite touching the ground. The central sulcus is straight though, because the collar part is here. So that, that when you look at the toe area of that foot, it looks like there's almost a shelf where that's what he's that's what's being worn that's where okay. the weight is yeah. so the hoof wall is not i mean there's going to be a little bit of weight on here but it's going to since it's at the same height most of the weight is going to be uh through this outer part of the the sole okay that's where the low, most of the weight should be on the sole and this is kind of uh, arizona so that's where this horse was, was at uh, and again, this is this is what I showed you before. This is straight coronet. Wait, we're not there. There we are. Okay. Yep. Okay. The straight. That's that's kind of what what I found in the last five or six years. When you start to have that, the frog gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's the that's the same same thing. Okay. I'm trying to move on here, so I don't take all day. This is the okay. Well, let me just ask you a, a question. Um, does the bone density recover when trimming is optimized as the, it should. It should. okay. Uh, yep. What it is, what you're going to have is a, I'll show you in a second. What you're going to have is the optimization of it is you're going to have a short toe. The frog is going to get, uh, larger, come forward and the heels are going to become uh, upright a little bit and, uh, the corner is going to become straight. That is you know, the way the coffin bone will get stronger, more dense. Okay. Uh, and this this is this just shows you the same thing. All these horses here. I have too many of these. These. All right. All right. This is another example of that. Oh, way back when, when I first got into this, I went to the equestrian center at the university. All these horses who were barefoot. They were being ridden for six hours a day in classes. And then as soon as they came off the uh, arena, I made an imprint of it. And this is kind of where the, the load was. This is a, the, that front part, where the, in front of the central sulcus, that part of the frog, that's what the, where it was weight bearing. And then I cleaned the foot out. And what you see here, this here is what the dirt plug is. This is the hoof. Okay, so when they, to go back here, when they, the, the dirt plug is extending below the, the, the hoof, okay, that's where the load is there. And when you remove the dirt plug with a wire brush, this becomes the, the, uh, the loading structure because the hoof is extending beyond the sole. So the dirt plug actually, it sounds to me, I don't know if you've it ever- does something, yeah. Yeah, those we used to have through. shoes that had that had a rolly bottom, and so it shortens your breakover. I had a pair, but it made my calf muscles so big I couldn't get in my britches. But but the whole idea is that if you have a nice dirt plug, it's actually going to 
lift the foot slightly off the ground and therefore ease the breakover on all edges. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does something, yeah. This, to go back to this foot here, you see this is where it's actually worn. Yep. And this is corresponding to this here. That's what, that's what the horses actually wants to walk on in a dirt uh, environment, okay? All right, and again, uh, are we all right for time? I mean, oh yeah, you can have all the time you want. Really here, some nerves, but, but all of these neural structures nerves. are in this frog part. Okay, <laughs> this here, there's uh, uh, proprioception is where the horse knows where its feet are, and these are Merkel. So these are touch receptors. Most of those are in the uh, uh, the frog surface, uh, and they're associated with the tubules. Uh, this this here is. Uh, just what they look like on a, on a histo histology. And they are, uh, they pick up the vibrations and that sort of stuff. Uh, so they, these are part of the earthquake detectors. Uh, horses, especially in earthquake country, people notice their horses get excited a day or so before the earthquake because the horses are feeling the vibration underground, that's what they're feeling through these sensory receptors. And and where do we find these receptors located again? These are, all right, this is a picture of the foot. They're gonna be, the big ones are here. This is why he, I'm, I'm kind of a guy that's interested in uh, heel first landing. These large uh, persinian corpuscles are at the heels. I mean, they, they go way up here, suggesting that's what the foot wants to have here. And, but most of the times, this is a, a racehorse that it's got a long toe. That's the problem with it. And, and there's others up here for uh, part of the DDFT that's attached to P2 here. It's, uh, they, they alert the horse to, to what's happening when the foot's on the ground. The horse must know where its feet are. This drawing here, I did this way back when. And what it is, it's not a good frog. You see how narrow it is? Mm -hmm. It should be uh, quite quite wide and everything, but that's kind of where they are. And those of you, have you ever been on a some sort of vibrator? Mm -hmm. it, it feels good. It's these persinian corpuscles that are being activated. And what you see here, these are smaller ones. Uh, these are associated with the frog stag. These are the frog tubule. And I'll just say here, this is a frog tubule in a frog. The, I'll just throw this out a little tidbit, is that the tubules in the foot, the largest ones are going to be associated with the, the central sulcus. Okay. The frog tubules, the width, this is just frog tubules and cut in half. The frog tubules here are one and a half to two times the diameter of the frog tubules that are at the apex of the frog or the heels of the frog. And they're much larger. Everyone focuses on the tubules and the hoof wall. The hoof wall tubules are very small. They don't have a lot of blood in them, okay? This here, the point, what I'm doing now is uh, this one and a half to two times the diameter of the frog tubules associated with the central sulcus is there's so much blood going through this when the frog is kissing the ground. When it's not kissing the ground, there's hardly any blood going through these. So, so let me see if I got this right, that these, um, are these Piscinian we're looking at? These are Piscinian, uh, these are, they're smaller ones. The Piscinian's quite large. They're up to a millimeter. These are uh, a tenth, tenth of that, 10%. So okay. they pick up smaller vibrations, more sensitive vibrations and that sort of stuff. And so there's more of them in the central sulcus than in the rest these of the These are frog? associated with the frog stay. Okay. Okay, all right. I don't see these anywhere else. To go back here. These Piscinians and laminated corpuscles, there are none are, are here where there are. There's none up here. Okay. The toe, suggesting possibly maybe that the front part of the sh foot should not be the first thing that hits the ground, which everyone knows toe first landing is not good. Right. There's something wrong with the foot. They're all back here and associated with the frog stay, which is here. Okay. Okay. So you want to trim to have a good frog. So the, so the horse knows where its feet are. And at the same time, when you do that, 
these tubules, oops, which you see here. Yeah. This this is a wall of these are two walls of the one tubule. Those tubules have well, I, I didn't measure it. It has eight to nine times as much blood going through the tubules there as opposed to the front part of the frog or the dorsal hoof wall. So the tubules are really blood rich. Around, yeah, right, yes. And they're detecting it, vibration. And so if we have a poor frog with a central sulcus that's migrating backwards, what's happening to these receptors? I assume the receptors are still there, but they're not being fully activated. Maybe they're less sensitive. Which means that the horse is going to be less clear about where he is in space. Right. Yeah, I think so. There's something wrong with how it, how it lands. And again, everyone says the foot is automatic. It's not quite automatic when you really get down to look at it. Uh, so, so somebody asked the question, how do shoes affect these sensors? I think that I think it's over. They're overwhelming the receptors, because a shoe, shoe is doing different things. But a, sh, a shod horse on a firm surface, the vibration is going to be off scale, and people have shown that back in Denmark. There's a vet school and farrier school. They show that the the vibrations with shoes on are uh, it does damage. I'll just say that to the foot. And of course, if the shoe yeah, is the taking the frog every... off the ground, that's going to kind of accentuate that even. Like if the frog could still kiss the ground with the shoe on, is that going to help? It's going to overwhelm. All right. There was this guy in 1989. He had a paper that they showed the, uh, his conclusion was that horses with shoes on should not go faster than a walk on a hard surface. That was his conclusion. But that was before we knew the, what the, the frequency was for vibration, uh, what you see here, damaging tissue. Right. And that's only become a thing in the last, I guess, 20 years or something like that. But it's a, but the vibration they had are, are it actually damages tissue. When you got these peripheral loading devices on hard surfaces. And is there a difference if they are plastic shoes? It will be less. So it's just a, uh, so I mean, I'm at the point where I think, I'm not saying every horse should be barefoot, okay? But if you, you have to protect the foot, my belief a metal shoe is not doing it. And I got to get another bulletproof vest. When I <laughs> <laughs> but I think the foot should be protected. Well, and, and that's I, always the struggle, isn't it, between between protecting the foot and not over wearing it. You know, I had a, a reining horse that was pigeon toed and if we didn't keep shoes on her because she would stomp fly, she just wear her feet off. So yeah, we had to yeah. do something to keep, you know, her from wearing but her I feet. But I believe there's, there's some people out there that are much smarter than I, they, they can find a material that is, generates less vibration because the vibration is killing the horse. Right. Okay, because what it does, uh, is when you get a, I forget exactly when you get close to uh, uh, 500 or 600 hertz or something like that with frequency, the, it constricts the vessels. I think I mentioned it too before, and I've talked, I, I think it's like five or 600 hertz. That when the frequency gets that high, they've shown the arteries in, in their model constricted, but a 15 second exposure to that high frequency. The vessel remained constricted for three days. Wow. Did you get that? Yeah, are you awake now? Yeah, yeah. I was just answering somebody's question. Um, so, so after the vibration, it stays constricted for three days before it finally stops being constricted? Yes, yes. This is, okay, so I, I'm going to switch gears completely here because this question is now burning my brain is, you know, like with surefoot pads, we see these horses reset. We see their proprioceptors apparently reset because they come off and they move different and everything. So it's got to be affecting these receptors in yeah. a positive way, maybe resetting them quicker. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, um, it, it's good stuff, but I, I really think someone has to come up with a way to protect the foot so it doesn't wear away, but they, it's, 
the metals, you got to find a material that doesn't generate a lot of vibration. Right. So that also, you know, a lot of people are using these vibra plates and putting horses on them. And I know horses love to stand on them, but how is that affecting their receptors? Oh, well, that's, it's going for the receptors. That's, it's activating them in a nice way. Okay. But, but why I say that, uh, and many of my navicular specimens I have, uh, when I look at the feet, because when the navicular horses, the, there's so much damage throughout the foot. It's not, navicular bone is not the problem in these horses. So much soft tissue damage. The vessels, after they're dead, are constricted. They don't dilate after because they, they produce another protein. So they remain constricted, I'll just say forever. So then all of a sudden you, you have the, the mechanism for dissipating energy and all that sort of stuff is, is out the window. So that's why these, a lot of these horses get down the tubes. Okay. Okay. Yep. Uh, okay. And this here, these are a lot of these touch receptors associated with the, the mouth of the tubule and in the lamina. These, these are melon, melon pigment tubules, I mean, melon granules that are being spewed out and picked up by keratinocytes. But the brown here is the shows of these, of these uh, they call them Merkel cells down here. These are what we have in our fingertips, suggesting maybe the horse, horses use the frog the, the same way. They're all over the place. Okay. Okay. So they're in the cornet and the frog, but are they in the, the are they in the hoof wall at all? No. So There's we're less of them. I'll put it that way. Okay. Yeah. But they they're in the lamina. Okay. Okay. But the lamina, it's 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 because they're going up and down. Because the oh, lamina the are, are with right. are close to the right border the where the blood vessels are or the dermis. So when the wall is being loaded, the, the wall is going one direction and the foot's going down the direction. So they're being stimulated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And again, this just shows you, uh, uh, this is my wife's horse a long time ago. And you see, this is uh, not good, but now his, he's got a straight coronet. Mm -hmm. So I know I figured out what was going on. This is on a, a cement blockway. And when we put him on the P-Rock, uh, this here, this shows you the what P-Rock does or any sort of conformable surface. Blood flow uh, becomes normal as opposed to when you have them standing here, the blood flow arch actually stops. When you see little gaps, just like the actually blood flow is not moving through this foot at all. Okay, so th that's what this is measuring is the blood flow through the foot. It's, it's then, I'm sorry, it's Doppler. I've, I thought you'd seen this before. It's Doppler. No, but foot. other people may not have seen it, Bob. <laughs> so I have to keep my I've seen it a long time, so I know. What it is. <laughs> sorry. It's okay. But, it, but what, what, this, what it was is that if you uh, have a horse standing on this, then you lift the other leg up. So this foot is doubly loaded. Yeah. And measure it at the level of the fetlock. Yeah. There's, uh, there's so much pressure inside the leg being double loaded that blood flow is actually stopped, or in this case here, it's going backwards. Wow. It's going back in the foot due to the pressure. But if you put it on P-Rock and do the same thing, it's, it's normal. Or in this case here, we just put a, a washcloth between the foot and the cement blockway. Right. It's, it's the touch. That's what the touch receptors do. What... Uh, uh, so the touch these, these receptors, things here, these Merkel cells, they allow the blood flow to move all the time. Okay, I think that's the bottom line that the yes. touch receptors ha um, are involved with blood flow, and if they're shut off, I guess is the right word, then you, you lose your blood flow. If if they're overwhelmed, like here, this is what you, you're too much pressure inside the foot. Uh, when you double, but if you activate these, uh, but again, you remember when they're on a hard surface, you only have, uh, I'm going back here, I'll show you this here. Okay, this leads me to another question. Okay, Always. this here, this is a feral horse. What we did here is you see the yellow spots. There's one there, two there, two there. This here, we had a board. And after we cleaned the, the dirt plug out, we rubbed this on. This here is the 
points of contact, high points on the foot when we put them on a hard surface. Right. Okay. Then you go back here. When they're on the, this surface here, there's the four points of contact. Remember back in the uh, 1990s, everyone was talking about the four point trim. Yeah. I thought this is the loading structure, but it's just the part of the foot that's uh, where the hoof wall is not being worn away. Okay, but when you had this here, blood flow is at double loaded, the blood flow is actually stopping the foot. The, these it, touch receptors aren't activated. But when you have a washcloth between that hoof here and the cement blockway, the cement block, the touch receptors are activated by the washcloth. This is so this leads me to a question about the dirt plug. It, is, the, is the dirt plug also then ser serving as a way? A purpose, serves a purpose, yes, a positive purpose. Because it's going to keep that foot from having that kind of really high pressure against a hard surface, right? Yes. It, it, to me, it also equally distributes the load. Right. The touch receptor is all around. Because that's what happens when you, you in the top here, if you clean that dirt plug out, you're, you're left with a hollow where the frog is. Then if you put it on a cement blockway and double load it, it's only... Uh, four points of contact that it has, all right? So, um, so I, could, I can't find the question right now, but somebody was asking about, you know, removing the dirt plug, but you know, what I find is I, I bring my horses in and if I have to clean their feet or rasp their feet, I clean the dirt plug out. But the next day they've got a dirt plug again, cause we have plenty of dirt for them to pack back in. So, you know, what's your thought about how, you know, I mean, all right, where I am, I've done it. It takes my horses a couple days to get the dirt plug back. Oh, okay. No, mine get it back the next day. We've got nice, soft, mushy dirt out there. <laughs> yeah, but it, so it varies. So I've never been a proponent of cleaning it out. Like I said, my farrier, my trimmer cleans it when maybe I just got too many things to do. That's how I like to think of it. <laughs> so. But if you're gonna rasp the foot, it's good to take the dirt plug out. Oh, so I, I, yeah, when I yeah when I rasp the foot, it does that. Yeah. Okay. So this is it, it, the point being here. This back part of the foot is where all the neural input is, all the sensory receptors are, and all that sort of. Most of them are. And the other thing, uh, uh, I won't show you here, but there are myxoid cells, M Y X O I D. These cells are there to allow the regeneration. Uh, regrowth, whatever term you want to use of this back part of the foot. They're all here. Okay. So, so what do your different colors mean on that side? The different types of sensory receptors. Okay. The, the, these here are the Pacinians at the heels and the frog stay here. You got the Merkel cells. There are smaller Merkel cells up here. Okay. And these here are Pacinians will associate this is a short tendon of the DDFT attaching here. These are important when this toe uh, come, uh, hyperextends, they're activated. Oh, okay, so, yeah. So the foot is well innervated, okay? It's kind of, it's like our hand. Right. Okay. okay, I got a question here. Somebody says, I just want to comment about the frog and the sensors. My horse would always pull away when the traditional fair, uh, trimmer trimmed the frog. I always felt like he didn't like it or hurt him and could, and could he feel it? Although the trimmer always said they don't feel anything there. Um, so, so I guess our trimmer saying that the frog doesn't feel things and now you're talking about sensors there. So is it possible for a horse to feel sensitive when you, when you trim the frog? This here is our Merkel cell. That's uh, what our, that's what you see. Those that we have in our fingertips. Yep. That is all of this here. They're all over the place. This is this, this all of it. Yeah. It would be the same as you take a rash to your finger. Ouch. To me, it hurts. And, you know, so uh, I think they can feel, that's what they use to feel the ground. If, if you watch a horse, if you clean the foot out and they're on a, like a, you're in a barn, you got a cement walkway or something. If you put a small pebble down or a BB, the horse yeah. knows when it's there. I mean, uh, it'll, it'll move its foot. So it's just a, And then somebody's asking, they're, they're planning on putting in a track system and they're wondering what the best footing is to maintain a healthy hoof. 
hard pack, gravel, soft. What are your thoughts on that? I think it should be varied. And then uh, it gives us, if you watch these horses, horses don't walk on, uh, on a barnyard. They don't go up and stand on the cement walkway. Usually. They find something that's comfortable. Quite often, if, if, if it's uh, very uh, soft and whatnot, they try to find something where they can put their heels up. So that all, uh, all the load's gonna be on their heels. Uh, so I let the horse decide where, where to stand. And so if we give them a variety of surfaces. A variety of surfaces, yeah. Yep. yeah, yeah. This here is, uh, oh, I was speaking somewhere and uh, I believe, all right, this, this here, these are uh, foot gurus. They're, they're very uh, good, smart people and nice and all that sort of, all these good qualifiers. But what it is, is they, they have the drawing here and they believe that the center of articulation from P2 coming down to the ground, it should be 50% behind and 50% in front of the foot. That's what they want for a healthy foot. And a lot of trimmers subscribe to this and that sort of stuff. And so I question everything. So what I did, I took a ruler and went from here to here and here to here. And you'll see they're, they're different. They're not the same distance. Right. Okay. I want uh, my... And this here is a, another where they had the same, they, they had it 50-50, but this is their line. And if you measure the line from here to the toe, it's not quite 50-50. Okay. These all had long toes, in my opinion. And to me, 50-50 is, uh, is it's, uh, I don't know what I have next. Yeah. This here is a, a three-year-old racehorse. And if you measure from here to here and then to the toe and then to the back, they all, these young horses, they all have very long toes. And that's when you start to get this atrophy of the frog. This, see the central the frog state here is starting to go this way. Yep. Central suckers is going towards the heel. So, and everyone, and I agree, uh, they had the argument that this is like, most horses are 60, 40 or whatever, 65, 30 or whatever. Um, and so 50, 50 is better. I want on my horse, I want to have, I, I strive to get close to 60 be behind and the difference 40 in front. It means they got a short toe. When you have this short toe, the frog gets bigger. Can you make the toe too short? All that sort of stuff. So it's just, a, that's what I want on my horse. Okay. But, so you can take it from there. So Bob, can you get the toe too short? I suppose you, you, if you could, if you try to do it all at once, yes. But if you start beveling this, uh, uh, do it gradually, especially, you know, uh, is, uh, especially when the frog starts to come in, you get the central sulcus on the ground. Uh, yeah, I, my philosophy on trimming, if you trim today and you got it uh, perfect tomorrow, it'll be less perfect because it's growing back. So if you, if this is 50, 50, if you came back and did a little bit of uh, beveling the toe between 10 and two, uh, uh, every two or three days, you'll eventually approach this uh, 40, 60, 60 in the back. Can you go to the next slide again? I got a question. So, so when you talk about the central sulcus being on the ground with, with this, picture, we see it sloping up toward the heel. You actually want to see that that uh, digital cushion is almost a straight line across the bottom. This, like this will be lower. Yeah, this this heel will be lower. Okay. This is the, the frog stay here. here. Okay, got it. Okay. So you want that parallel to the ground. Yeah. Right. Well, the frog, stay, the frog stay will be perpendicular to the ground. The central sulcus is, is, the, is the shallow spot around it. Okay, so I'm just trying to think if you have a cross section of a really good foot showing us the frog stay. It'll, it'll be it'll be uh, going up here and it'll, it'll come down like that. Okay. Okay, and you see see this here is a, a racehorse. The end of the coffin bone is here. This toe. You want someone like that? Yep. 
And then I agree with all the biomechanics. They're all better, smarter than I am. They're all less, uh, less pull and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah. And the problem is, this is when you start to see other problems uh, uh, with, the, with these feet. Because what you're going to have is uh, you'll start to see on all my racehorse feet I have and uh, I have an, I've had a, a lot of them over the years, hundreds. Uh, as they'll always see hemorrhage through here. That they always got problems with these feet, even when they're they, they, these are these are three year old uh, racing quarter horses. Uh, even though they didn't show any clinical signs, because at the racetrack they're kind of wound up, they're excited and all that sort of. They don't really feel anything. All right. So far, so good, okay? Yep. I wanna show you what happens by not coming inside the white line. When I left MSU is, uh, I got in the mail, uh, uh, well, I had a, a big box of uh, uh, three-year-old racing quarter horses, which I had not had a chance to look at. So I cleaned them up and all this sort of stuff. And what it is, is I found that these, uh, I had 35 of them, okay, 30 from 30 to five racehorses. And these racehorse feet at three-year-old quarter horse, they're plus or minus the, the same, identical, because they're all from five race or tra five race tracks from one state. So it's a homogeneous population. And what you see here, they have a very short toe. This, this, this is more steep. This here is the collateral uh, where the collateral ligaments of the coffin joint attaches here, okay? And that's just a beginning of getting holes in the bone. The porosity of these little small holes is not a good thing, okay? Now, the way uh, we trim is uh, the sole is here, the white line is here. Most people will, uh, uh, they'll either trim it out here or sometimes they'll bevel, but they'll bevel at this hoof wall white line junction, okay? That's yes, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. all right. What it is, is I told you that this hoof wall is growing down from the cornet down to the ground, but it's also growing out from the bars this way. Yep. So what's gonna happen if you continue to do it, this toe is going to continue to get longer, depending on how frequently you do this. If you, if, you got a question? Well, I'm just thinking that the white line you can see here in this toe, if somebody keeps trimming and they don't want to go inside the white line, the white line is advancing because the toe and the sole is advancing. The whole, right. And what that's all right. Since you brought it up, I'll go one step further. If you trim uh, infrequently, if you're trying to save money uh, with your trimmer and you trim it five, six, seven, eight weeks, this toe is going to get longer. Where's the arrow? All right, this toe is going to get longer, okay? And if you put shoes on, you want to save money. Uh, you remove the shoes every, I don't know, eight, nine, 10, whatever it is. The toe gets even longer, right? Okay, and so what, what has happened, this coffin bone is reacting, gonna to react to that. Not only the hoof, but the coffin bone is going to react to that, okay? Yes. Yeah. This this you you should be thinking here, okay? Okay. So, all right. So what you see here, all right? These are three rows and quarter. I had thirty five feet, and what I did with these, uh, I got the bones, navicular bone, P two and P and P one, all of that, that all this sort of stuff. And I started measuring, and just I'll show you where the DDFT comes down and attaches to the semilunar line, and from the end of the semilunar line which is underneath here to the tip of the coffin bone. And these 35 feet, they were all the same. It was 31 plus or minus a fraction of a millimeter. All right, plus or minus, it's, it's a fraction of a millimeter. They're all pretty constant. They were the same width, yep. okay? What happens though is, uh, oops. This here, when you look at an older quarter horse, same width, food, same, foot, same in size, what it is, what you see, is this angle here.
this angle of the dorsal cortex uh, is longer, but it's more shallow. Okay. This, this is something you're going to have to just think about the people. Okay. What had happens is as this uh, hoof wall gets longer, the sole gets longer, what's going to happen is it's actually elevating. Uh, I don't know if I have radiographs with this or not. You actually can actually see the periosteum is being pulled off for this bone. You've all seen the slipper toes on radiographs. Yep. Everyone knows what the slipper toe. But unfortunately, where this is, the periosteum comes down and where it's pulled off, okay, I'll just say it goes out this way, bone is being proliferating and it fills in from the top of that periosteum to the bone. The key is it fills in. Then after six months to a year, if you take another radiograph, this slipper toe is gone. It's no longer there. You know, you no longer see that J-shaped part of the hoof, uh, coffin bone. But what it is, you see the coffin bone, but it's out here further. It's elongated. So the coffin bone keeps it keeps laying down more bone as it's the periosteum is being pulled, and so the angle keeps changing. Right. The right. That's what you see. You can see that slipper toe on that uh, coffin bone in the teenage quarter horse, pretty sure. This, you, you'll be able to see it. This, this has got something, this, uh, uh, these are feet that died at a racetrack. So we had a fracture here, that's kind of, you, but yes. Uh, uh, I have seen one race horse that had laminitis and it rotated and he uh, raced and died, mm -hmm. okay. So what, what happens is, is when this grows out this way, it elongates, okay? It's being filled in, but it means this, the, the key here, and this is, to me, it's so fascinating, that this, all of this bone is responding to the change in the biomechanics. The entire coffin bone starts to remodel to this increased length of the toe. Wow. Okay, yep. just, just shake your head, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. What you see here is we see this collateral ligament here of yep. the coffin the joint. Yeah. See where it is here on these three year olds? Yep. That is remodeling too. So the whole foot is, the coffin bone is getting longer. Yep. You see where it is? It's, it's moving forward. And at the same time, this palmar process is starting to go backwards. It's starting to, it's trying to balance itself. Right. And when all this remodeling is going on, the coffin bone uh, is uh, becoming less dense. Right. Okay. Now this here, I, this is uh, why I go to, I, I, I'm part of a school in Sweden too, but this is kind of, of uh, what I, I, I love going there because where I go they use standard breads and what they do they try to get the toe longer faster so they don't uh, get out of their sulky gait pace and all that sort of stuff and so what you see this increase in length of the toe you see it much sooner than you do in the racing quarter horses wow and again and what you see here is when you, I think I have everyone's together, or you see this here, this angle here, there's a, I think there's a seven degree difference. These are the, uh, uh, do with PowerPoint and that sort of stuff. So this toe, well, this is the racing uh, standard. The toe is longer here than it is here, even the same age, uh, because they, they really, ex really actually tried to extend the, uh, the length of the coffin bone. But what you see here, it becomes very porous. The bone becomes very porous because, uh, just put that aside, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. All right? so, but the main thing is, is the foot doesn't increase in width, but the toe gets longer and the power process will start to elongate out this way. So somebody's asking if, if the bone is remodeled, what can you do? Do you just need to honor the changes or can you actually, can it remodel it, back? It, rem it remodels. And that's kind of. Uh, oh, and, 
I'll just won't go back all the way. This here, this here, if you if you just trimmed at the white line, this hoof wall will continue down. You're removing that when you trim, but the sole is actually elongating. And you can gauge that by the central sulcus as it goes towards the, the palmar process, I mean, towards the fetlock. When you, when you see the crana, or this is going this way, the toe is too long, you have to come inside that. And that's why you have to start beveling this way. Yep. And over a period, and by doing that, you get rid of the crana over a period of time. This frog will get bigger and bigger and bigger. This bone will get thicker and thicker and thicker, more dense. So I, I have a question about sole depth. Um, so uh, somebody's asking, how much of an issue is shallow sole depth, or how concerned are you about shallow sole depth, and how do you how do you address it? On on radiographs, oh, I'm trying to be diplomatic here. When people do it on radiographs, they're measuring a little. You see, this is the bone. This has been damaged bone here, but you're measuring the bone. This is the dermis here. Yep. This is the hoof wall. They're measuring most all of that to the bone. Okay. And uh, I just have a problem with that because most of all, what they're measuring, most all of this is just soul. Soul is an epidermis. And if there's not much of a uh, very little blood in the tubules there, there's nothing there to protect the, protect the bottom part of the foot. Okay. Uh, so, but I don't know what increases the, the thickness of the sole. I've been told by there's a, oh, there's a drug you use. A, I can't think of it name. And I tried that a number of times on one of my horses. Uh, uh, I think there's a, uh, just a, a seasonal where it gets thinner and, and uh, sheds more and that sort of stuff. Uh, but uh, the long toes, they, they uh, often will have a, a shorter toe in my experience. So, I mean, or more shallow, I should say. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so is sole depth, is that, do you think it's more of a genetic component then versus a structure, you know? A I, think, I think it's environmental structure, us, what the horse is doing, the trimmer, uh, environment moving and all that sort of stuff. I'm not into the genetics things. Okay. Like, and, you know, but like some horses, they say like thoroughbreds just have thin soles and other horses have- It's the way they're trimmed. Oh, okay. It's the way that you, because they always want a long toe and then right. they trim this way. So this is always longer, it's thinner. So it's kind of like taking the same amount of material and spreading it over a larger yeah, area. It's like a pizza, you roll it out. You want a bigger pizza, you just take the same amount of dough and make it- Thinner crust. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Because like, Navicular, I've, I've got feet from Arabs that were navicular, and Arabs are not supposed to get navicular. Yeah. But if you trim them right and, and you get a large rider, they get navicular. Okay. Have to be careful of it. All right. So this, yeah. Uh, this here is a standard, standard bread. This, it gets faster, uh, long toe faster because they, they do that. And also the porosity gets faster. This increased porosity, uh, everyone thinks it's normal. I don't want it on my horse. It's kind of like you don't want it on your bones and that sort of stuff because it's it means there's less bone there. It's setting up for problems down the road. Uh, and here, here, this is what I was trying to show. This is a three-year-old uh, quarter horse. This collateral uh, dip where the collateral ligaments are is further back than this uh, this is a four or five year old uh, standard bread. It's further forward, but it's because the toe is being longer, elongated already. The same age there, because they, they, they try, they trim these feet so they they get long fast. Because uh, that way they'll, they'll, their gait, they won't uh, break stride when they're uh, racing. But at the same time, they're making the coffin bone more uh, osteoporotic. Okay, yep. and so this here, just to show, oops, sorry. This, this is a standard bread. This is a quarter horse. This is a quarter, but this is a teenage quarter horse. And you see the angle? Yep. They're, they're different. And they're the same width, the width hasn't changed. But what you see is 
this here, and again, it's the, it's the neat thing is the entire foot is remodeling. This collateral ligament is going forward, so it's, it's, it's even further. It's up underneath the, the caudal part of this extensive process, the front part of it. And you see all this stuff back here that's, that's happening, okay? Which is just kind of, uh, it's just, wow, that's, that's my expression. I can't imagine we're doing this to, to horses. But we do a lot of things to horses. Okay. Oh, and with this here, when you start to see this, not only you get, I'll show you the remodeling. All of my navicular, this distance from the semi line to the tip of P3, where I mentioned these, these horses here, this three or, a quarter, uh, three or a quarter horses, they're all 31 plus or minus, it's a fraction of uh, 31 millimeters plus or minus something. This three-year-old standard braids are the same, but as, as they get older, this gets longer. All my navicular horses, this is a navicular horse, all my navicular horses, it was between 40 and over 50 millimeters between where the DDFT attaches to the tip of the coffin bone. They had a real long coffin, coffin bone. Did that cause calcification of the DDFT? Just that kind of strain? It's, it's, it's part of it is that, but, uh, uh, but the biomechanics were, were see, the, uh, I see here's the seminal line where the DDFT is. Oh, that is what I was measuring on these bones and you yeah. can measure it on radiographs. But what happens is, is just, it's not, it's not the pull but the biomechanics is changing. Because what, what it is when you see in this three-year-old, the digital cushion is not that bad. You start, you start to see effects, but because the toe is getting longer, but as this toe gets longer, this bone will get longer. This, you can actually see some of these uh, fascia here, yeah. they're destroyed. So the biomechan, the, it's, I liken it to the foot being hit by a hammer. Okay. And it's, it's just destroyed. So the ability to dissipate energy, support itself and everything got, kind of goes out the window and, as they get older. So by the time you get to be a, a, a teenage horse, this is a, the digital cushion is nothing. But I mentioned to you the myxoid cells, MYXOID. Yep. If you start to bevel the toe, you can shorten, you will change this. It'll take time because the bone has got to remodel, but the frog will get bigger and better. So the fascinating thing is how much the foot can actually try and heal itself due to those myxoid cells. If we just it, take this really, stress it off. really does a pretty good job because you uh, these myxoid cells are here where the arrow is. Okay. You don't see them here. Or they're very few. You don't see them here. That's why la with laminitis you get more scar tissue and that sort of thing. But it's there's other things happening there too. I'm starting to find out. Uh, that's the beauty of being hunkered down. <laughs> I, have, I have time to look at sections. It's just kind of, wow. I just turned the radio on to classical music and it's just me and my cat. Yep. That's cool. Okay. So, so again, to go back, when you have this here, you're loading the hoof wall, all of this stuff, uh, the frog and everything starts to atrophy. So it starts to uh, go bad and that sort of, but also with the shoe on a, on a firm surface, the vibra they've actually shown the vibration gets very high. It skyrockets, okay? And that causes constriction of vessels and all this sort of stuff. So there's a lot of things happening. And so this here, this is uh, from Dr. Pollock's book, uh, the suspensory apparatus of the distal phalanx. Those are those connective tissues that go from the hoof wall lamina to the coffin bone. And that's kind of, their argument they use uh, when you have the shoe on, that's what is actually suspending the coffin bone. Uh, these connected, it's probably the dermis and all that, so it's actually suspending the horse inside this hoof wall here, okay? And so this is kind of what you see here. This is a, a horse, you see how porous this is? Yeah. Okay, this here is a, I forget, this is either a 17 or 25 year old Tennessee walker that was barefoot the last 10 years. These big holes here are actually blood vessels, but you see uh, it's a rounded edge, there's not many holes there. Right. 
force. The bone density is higher in this foot versus this foot. Right. And if you, uh, uh, this here is, we did this, uh, I work with some engineers, human engineers, and what they did, they defined an element model and we loaded the hoof wall here on their model. That's what the blue is. The coffin bone is here. Yep. And the conclusion was that in this part of the bone here, uh, this is the hoof, you loaded this here, the hoof wall. Bone, they're saying bone is being uh, lost in this part of the coffin. I'm just saying it's not being laid down. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, and then this here, this here is a slipper toe. This is kind of the long toe. This you've seen the slipper toe. Yep. So the periosteum is being elevated way out here. So this is gonna be fill in if you came back and took a radiograph six, seven months later, three year, you wouldn't see that slipper toe. The toe would look pretty nice, but except if you measure from here to here, it'd be uh, two or three millimeters longer. And that's by trimming to the white line. You have to trim inside the white uh, wall for the sole getting longer and longer and longer. Most of you have heard of pedal osteitis. When you get this long, uh, um, bone around here, it gets thin, and that's breaking that off. That's what hurts. That's pedal osteitis. And most of pedal osteitis are, occurs on the lateral side of the foot, which I'll get to in a second. So if you start to load more sole uh, length here, uh, you're actually, bone is being laid down. I like to say it's not, the engineers uh, is not being, uh, the engineer said it's uh, being laid down. I like to be more conservative, it's not being lost. And this here is supposed to be the, the coffin bone is like this. This here is uh, uh, the thickest part of the coffin bone, so it's it's good. And again, this is this walker here. So it's, it's a very close up, but there's not, not a lot of holes. Right. And rounded edges and that sort of stuff. And if you take, do uh, a radiograph, this is uh, just a, a regular foot, I forget what it is, but it's, uh, you can see how thin it is at the periphery. That's a foot like this. This is slipper toe, but I saw it that way all the way around the coffin bone. Oh, okay. And this is what you see here. This is a, a, a barefoot. It's, a, it's actually a, a feral horse. See how dense the bone is? Same age. So basically you took coffin bones from a slipper toe foot and a feral horse foot and had a CT scan done. And so what we're seeing is the bone density on each of the coffin bones. Is that right? Just yeah, so this, this, I don't know if this had a slipper toe, but that's just a normal foot, okay. normal domestic horse. Okay. On the left. Yeah, yeah. And what it is, is, uh, uh, and again, this gets back to what we've been saying that if you take a foot and you have them, um, on the left here, you have them stand on a, uh, a cement surface, go back to the uh, Doppler ultrasound. Right. The pressures are at this four points are very high because you have a small surface area of loading the foot. And if you take that same foot and put it on a, like your hard rubber mat in the stall, yep. it's, it's still quite hard, but it's not rock hard like a, a cement. The, uh, the pressures get much less. And the reason for that is you're, you're increasing the surface area on this hard rubber. That's why uh, rubber mats, conformable surface and everything like that are better. You get a better perfusion of the foot as opposed to hard surfaces. And that changes from footfall to footfall depending on what the horse is after. Horses, horses um, they showed accidentally at uh, Texas A&M, A&M, they took their mascots, which are, I forget it was a Mustang, it was a horse. A lot of horses, and they put them on, a, uh, kept them on a, uh, a cement paddock because it's easy to hose down and that sort of stuff. And they all came down in the vicular. Most of them came down in the vicular after a few months because the surface air, the sur small surface air on the foot creates high pressures and it's a lot of stress on the inside of the foot. Okay. So if you take a foot, this is just a normal, a regular coffin bone that had a little steep side. Uh, it's usually the medial side. That's 
and there's more flare on the layout, but that's the way we trim. We, I cut different sections, proximal to distal, that, 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 all this sort of stuff. And what we showed is, uh, uh, is this is the cortex here. This is on the steep side. It's, it's significantly thicker bone and the trabecular, what you see here is thicker than on the flared side of the foot, this thinner bone. See the flared side has thinner bone, but this is where you get the pedal osteitis most of the time. Okay, so I was I was looking at a question about flared, and I, I lost the point here. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's okay, because we have a question for, for, the question is for straight flared sides of hoof, which, which are past the 10 to two area of the hoof wall, more like nine to three or even eight to four, would Bowker, would you suggest beveling those areas past the white line as well? I'm, I'm a little confused by the question. That's, I basically- All right, all right. Look, all, right the, all right, let me go back here. All right, this foot here, all right. If you had a, uh, the flared side was on the left one, what and more steep here, and you were trying to get that more symmetrical. Yep, there we go. Arrows? Yeah. Okay. What you would do is you'd bevel. The best way to do it is bevel all the way around, uh, just inside the white line. Uh, you can initially you can just bevel at the hoof wall white line junction, then start to beveling inside the white line to get more. You want to get more solar loading, so more of the load is going to be on the central part of the foot, or this. It's really this part here, okay? Okay. And you'll notice that when you do that, the frog will come forward, central sulcus will get bigger and all that sort of stuff. The foot will become much more symmetrical. You, you have to do it here, all the way around. So if you have a flare, you do all the way around. Yeah. And you'll notice when you look at these flares, they're not just from here to here. Uh, is that you'll you'll see that there'll be portions. Sometimes it'll only be like from. Uh, I have to look at a watch now. Uh, between uh, eleven and and ten and eleven, it'll be flared. That's will be and so that you definitely have to do that. But you'll notice the opposite side of the foot will also be affected. This will be more uh, underrun over here. The opposite side. I showed you this before. Mm -hmm. Lisa Lancaster and I we had a paper. Uh, a long time ago that and the more you look at this they're not just this side is going to be more flared than this side there's the, the flares can be localized that's again the, everything is very adaptable right and so if you know what to do you can help it adapt faster okay I think a lot of our viewers probably will wind up taking a trimming course sooner or later. <laughs> well, it, it's 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 easy to it, it's easy to trim your foot, uh, and especially if you know what is there, and if you're first starting in, just trim it a little bit on Monday, two or three swipes around, see what the horse does, and that sort of stuff. Then do it every few days. You get more aggressive, and uh, that way you're not going to make your horse sore. Right. Okay. All right, so this here is a three-year-old racehorse. And we, we had a computer whiz who put these colors and all that sort of stuff. The purple is the least dense, the more porous bone. The red is the most dense in this racehorse foot. This, so this is the flared side of the foot. You see where the, the bone is least dense here. You see this little divot here? There's a little, uh, uh, at the toe, there was a, uh, not a nail, but the uh, part in the shoe. Yeah, totally. I, I can't think of it, but but it puts pressure on the bone. When you put your nails in, sometimes if you're too close, you may not uh, make the horse sore quicken, but you'll be enough pressure such that this part of the foot will erode away. And that's kind of what this is here. It, it wasn't uh, an excessive amount, but just enough pressure that it caused the bone to become less porous here, or more more or less de um, less dense, not more or less dense, but it became less dense. Okay, you see that all the time. All right, and all of these, the density, they're not all the same. They vary from foot to foot to foot to foot because it depends on the load and pressures and all that sort of stuff. So again, when you're loading the periphery, 
there's less bone here, uh, which is this here is the strongest part of the bone. Okay. And so when you load the periphery, this gets thinner. Uh, yeah. So what, all right, to go back, to, all right, so far so good. Yep. I know I'm skipping around trying to hurry here. So. This year I want to add back the uh, <laughs> suspensory apparatus. Yep. All right. What happens, this is where we get the pores. When you suspend the coffin bone, all right, the connective tissue has got to support the horse from the hoof wall or the connective tissue in the, the dermis. What it is, the fascia here start to migrate into the bone. Okay. This is a coffin bone here. The dermis is here on the right hand side. Uh, I don't see your pointer. Oh, uh, right here. Oh, there it is. Okay, it's back. Got it. This here is the uh, the uh, the dermis. Yep. On the left hand side of this right figure, this here is all bone. Okay. Okay. Now, if you go to the the left hand side, you can actually see the lamina. Yep. This is the coffin. This is a, a young horse, a barefoot. This you see the bone here. This is the periosteum between the two white lines. Got it. Okay. Now, when you start to load the wall, the wall is being loaded. And so the forces are coming in from the wall into the bone this way, where the air was going. Yep. So it's causing the, the connective tissue making up this periosteum and the dermis to orient towards the bone. And so that's what you have here, where you have uh, the blue lines are actually going into the bone here. Yep. Okay. And what you see, this is real bone here. We lost, there's your pointer again. It gets, it gets lost on the light color background. Okay. 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 You see where the bone is? Yep. We're on the right hand figure of this. The, the left portion of the right figure is all bone. Okay. Okay. The right hand side of that same figure, this is all dermis. And you can see the, the fascia is starting to be angled towards the bone here. Okay. Yep. It penetrates it. And when it does, you see, I don't know, between the two, uh, that's why I put the two white lines, between the two white lines, this bone changes from bone to connective tissue. Cool. Cartilage, connective tissue, whatever, like insertions, all right? That's, there'll be less, uh, that's what you see all these cell changes here for so far. Yep. Okay. And oh, this is a little high power. It actually sees it. So you can see the, the fascia coming in. It's kind of going this way. You can see the white lines going in. Yep. It's causing the bone. This was originally bone here to become more uh, connective tissue, fascia, uh, cartilage, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Then, then it becomes bone here. So when you look at the, this under a microscope, this bone has gone, this coffin bone has gone from here to here, it's lost that. And so the bone gets thinner and thinner and thinner. That's why it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. Uh, okay. This is a radiograph. Young foal, oh, I'll just say from the dorsal surface to the underside, it's thick all the way to the bottom. As the horse gets older, depending on usually how it's trimmed, they got shoes on, this bone will be thick up here. It gets thinner and thinner and thinner until you get pedal osteitis down here. And it happens because of the, uh, the fascia coming in and changing this bone to connective tissue, then it becomes uh, no longer any bone. Okay, you can actually see it being oriented in here, all right? Then when you clean the, do the histology, what you see here on the left-hand side, uh, on the left side of this left-hand figure, this is all bone. Yep. You see the arrows here, all right, the arrow. This groove here, that's the pores being cut uh, and looked under the microscope. This uh, part here, this is the dermis. These are the lamer attaching to the bone, but you see there's a hole here in the bone. So this part of the bone here has actually been gone. It's no longer there, it's, it's removed. 
And the right hand side is just another section where you can see this is all bone. This is a pore here. This is a, a part of the bone. This is a pore. This is the lamina attached to the bone. It's, it's, the bone is, is um, trying to use this connective tissue to support itself with a hoof wall. Oh. Yes, just say yes, okay. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm just reading your windshield what? wiper comment there. <laughs> All right. So what happens here, this here, you see blood vessels. Yes. Okay. Everybody thinks these blood vessels are going uh, from the bone to support the lamina. And it's not. They're going the other, they're going the other way. Because what has happened is this bone gets, uh, uh, I'll go back here. As you see this, this bone here on the flared side, it's get, it gets more osteoporotic. Right. What what Mother Nature does, she's trying to uh, revitalize that bone so she'll take some of the blood vessels from the dermis between the hoof wall and the bone, come through those holes to try to regenerate this. It's pretty smart. Yes, so please. not all flares are man-made, right? I mean, horses are gonna have flares even if they were feral. Yeah, but but it depends. Yeah, it's there. It's part of their confirmation at that point in time, but it's not in the genetic makeup to have flare. Okay. It's, it's their injured start walking differently or whatever. It's kind of like when we were young, we all had perfect bones, and after you get above thirty nine, you start to go to the dogs. So yeah, because so many things can you know injuries, yeah. you know movement patterns can can affect that. And this is just another example of that, okay? Uh, the, the collagen uh, is here. And the, I'll just throw this out. This is bone here on the left. Yep. The collagen you see here, the lamina supporting it. The more you support the hoof wall, uh, the more you support the horse for the hoof wall, the collagen fibers, they start to hypertrophy. Okay which means so between the bone and the coffin and the hoof wall, the, it becomes all connective tissue. It starts to squeeze the blood vessels. All right. And again, this bone here uh, doesn't have, that's what I want my horse's bone to look like. I don't want them to look like this. And on an x-ray, it would show up as that really nice dense white bone yeah, in the pictures yeah. we showed us, yeah. And if you, Go back here. See, if you look at a lot of radiographs. And it's taking a little time for us to catch up to you there. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, this here. This is a radiograph of a shod foot. When you look at a lot of radiographs, uh, if you've got a real good bone uh, density, this bone will be white, 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 white. Yep. It'll almost be as dense as the nail. Wow. It's usually not that way in a shod horse because of the nail. But what it is when it becomes more gray, it becomes yep. more porous. And if you if they have a good radiograph, you can actually see many of the holes. There'll be divots, it's usually here and distally, where the bone is being eroded away. Uh, it won't be thick. And if you look look here, you see how white this is here? Yeah. Down bottom, the sole. This here, you see this is irregular along here? Yep. Okay. That's what the porosity is. The And right up here is usually where you have uh, less bone density. It's it's it's. It, it changes color, it's more gray. And, uh, and that, that's when you start to get problems with these feet. See, that's all due to us. Uh, all right, so we, we're, we've gone past two hours, Bob. I'm just hoping you might be coming to a close soon, not gonna, Rush. I have another hour of talking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I always plan two hours, Bob, when I have you on. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah, this is it.
but it's uh, uh, when you start to see the, the change in bone density, that's where you start to have uh, problems. Uh, you know, pilosteitis, and there's always fractures, breaking off. Navicular syndrome is a, is a man-made thing. Uh, and I really think laminitis, you're gonna find that's gonna be man-made or we feed them and also the, how they're being loaded and that sort of stuff because the, uh, the dermis is a small surface area, a small volume and uh, the more stress it is, it becomes more uh, connective tissue and blood vessels disappear. So anyway, I think that's it. That's kind of, yep. Awesome. Uh, don't we wish we were all in shorts in summertime? Yeah, I'm, I swear I'm waiting for the the days are getting longer. I'm waiting for the temperature to get higher. So yep, yep. Great. My horse has already started to shed a tiny bit, so I'm really excited. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's it. Uh, yeah. This is uh, once again super fascinating. People have really enjoyed it. We've been having comments all the way along, and um, and I just love when you get into the the nerves and the and the. Um, sensor. Oh, yeah, no, the nerves are without, without the nerves, you're a vegetable. Yeah, exactly. So I always get excited when you get there. Um, I really appreciate you spending the time with us. I know you got a lot of other things you're working on. So it's, I'm just really grateful that you, uh, no, it's, it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. And people really love it. I just want you to know that your, your webinar has been one of the most popular. It was the most popular for a really long time. Now it's number two but not far behind so people are really getting a lot out of it so That's thank good. you so much for they, spending they can save their horses from my yeah. perspective yeah I, and i think what we need to do next is be able to give people well i'm going to start working on that a, a lot of people are asking questions about how to trim specifically but i think that we have to leave that up to the people that teach that have yeah. the courses teaching trim um because so many people I think now are getting interested in doing their own horses. And, and actually for me, that's been one of the best learning education oh, yeah, yeah, I've yeah. ever had. If you go slow and don't, you know, that's when you learn. Yeah. yeah. So thanks a lot, Bob. I hope spring comes soon to Michigan. <laughs> me too. All right. Take care. Be good. Take Thank care. you guys. Bye. Bye-bye.